Quat. I'm your host, Tom Kearns, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, episode 49, Resources. With Kent wrapped up, and while I'm working on the next part of the podcast, I wanted to do another Patreon request episode. I've been asked by Father Christopher Machelek to talk a bit about good books and resources for studying Anglo-Saxon history. This episode will be a bit more freeform than others, as I'm just going to go through what, for me, have been some of my go-to resources over the years. Some of these are academic books, so when they are likely to be expensive, I will say so, and I will also try to come up with good alternatives to suggest where possible. I'm going to approach this starting first with primary evidence and good translations, good collections, that kind of thing, and then move into general secondary evidence. Um, So good historians, good particular works of historiography. Obviously, we could get very specialised and very specific, but that would take a very long time and I don't think it would be particularly interesting So I'm not going to do that just now. If you want to have those recommendations, just let me know and reach out to me. Um, So this is all going to be fairly specific and I think fairly good for someone who is new to this topic or who just wants to dive a bit deeper. So let's begin with primary evidence. I want to start off by repeating the usual academic point that a translation is only ever so good since translation is in itself an act of interpretation. To really get the most of primary evidence, it's always best to try and learn the original language and to read them that way. That way you'll get various nuances and impressions of effect that you can't really replicate in another language. Latin is fairly widely available, even Duolingo has a Latin course now. Um, which I wish I had done that when I was at school, but, you know, times change. Old English is a bit more specialised. The book that I learned from is Bruce Mitchell's and Fred Robinson's A Guide to Old English, since that was the textbook used by my Old English class at Cambridge. It has grammar and translation exercises, as well as a dictionary specific to the text included in the back, so it's a good book for self-learners. Another resource that I cannot recommend enough is Peter Baker's Old English Magic Sheet, which is a one-page summary of Old English grammar that you can print out and refer to. It really got me through a lot of translation sessions. For word memorization, Memorize.com has a bunch of good Old English courses, and there's also the website Old English Aerobics, where you can also find the Magic Sheet. Also useful is Bosworth Toller's online Old English Dictionary, which works like any other dictionary websites online. Just know that it is a dictionary, not a translator, so you need to know the Old English word you're searching for, and you can't look up the modern word's equivalent. It also helps to know a bit about Old English grammar to get the most out of it, so have the magic sheet ready. With that out of the way, let's move on to the actual recommendations. One of the go-to books that I've used for years is English Historical Documents, Volume 1, edited by Dorothy Whitelock. It's a huge book full of various law codes and letters and charters and pieces of primary material covering the period from 500 to 1042. They're all translated, and they all have little introductions at the beginning explaining what they are. It's still, honestly, my go-to for reading primary material. Uh, Similar to it is the first volume of Councils and Synods of the English Church, which is basically very similar to English historical documents, except that it is specifically about ecclesiastical history. So it's things like decrees of church councils, important letters, important chronicles, that kind of thing. Neither of these, I'm afraid, really has a cheaper or free alternative. Um, But some of the texts can be found online, it just really depends what you're looking for. Since they are both quite academic, I'm afraid they do carry a hefty price tag. But that's a little bit unavoidable. I'd recommend not investing in them unless you're sure you're going to get a loss of use out of them. 
and instead trying to find alternative individual translations online, which they do exist, but not for everything. My next recommendation is The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles by Michael Swanton. This is my go-to translation of the Chronicles. Not only have I found it to be generally reliable, but Swanton also has arranged the different recensions of the Chronicles side by side, which makes it extremely easy to compare them and to see what one recension says and what one recension doesn't say, and etc, etc, so on and so on. This one, if I remember, is a fair bit more available than either English historical documents or councils and synods, and is also available at a more reasonable price than either of those two books. Probably the most important source for Anglo-Saxon history, and the one that most people will probably begin by reading, is, of course, Bede. The best translation out there of his ecclesiastical history is the one done by Colgrave and Miners, spelt M-Y-N-O-R-S. This is the one that is usually used by scholars, and as such is the closest thing we have to an authoritative translation. It also has the original Latin on the facing page, which I always appreciate. It's hard to find, though. It's available through Oxford Medieval Texts from Oxford University Press, and it can easily cost in the triple figures, so it is definitely not for everybody. The other translations that are available by Penguin and Oxford University Press, the Penguin Classics and the Oxford World Classics edition, um, while they're not authoritative, are still very good and perfect if you just want to read Bede and get a sense of what he says. Myself, I prefer the Oxford version, but if you just want to read Bede without spending a lot of money, then either of them will serve you well. For Old English poetry, the situation is a bit more complicated. During my time at university, the only go-to edition I had was S.A.J. Bradley's Anglo-Saxon Poetry. It's really not ideal since he doesn't translate all of the poems, some of the smaller ones he just summarises, and I have found that the translations themselves are a bit patchy in places, but it gives a good general sense of what the poems say. More recently, a book was published called The Complete Old English Poems, translated by Craig Williamson, which I actually haven't had the chance to read in full yet, but from what I have read, it is much better than Bradley. So if you want to read all Old English poetry, I would recommend that book. I believe it is available on Kindle, um, but even so, it does still carry a slightly hefty price tag, but still under $100 from what I've found. If you'd rather not spend any money... A lot of Old English poetry is available online in translation. Uh, the Rutgers University Old English Poetry Project is freely available, and I found to be generally good, although it's not yet finished, so it isn't complete, it doesn't have everything. For a good overview of all Old English literature, including prose, I can also recommend the Anglo-Saxon Literature Handbook by Mark Amodio which it's not translations, it's just brief historical introductions and overviews of every piece of Old English literature that is extant. One poem in particular that I've been asked about is, of course, Beowulf. The most easily available translation is the one by Seamus Heaney. This is generally fine for understanding the story, but it's not the most accurate translation out there, if that's what you want. For my money, the best translation I've found is the one by J.R.R. Tolkien. The third year of my old English class was literally just Beowulf, and in that time we had to read the whole poem in Old English. When I was doing that, I found that Tolkien's translation is so close to the actual Old English that you can reliably reuse it as a study guide alongside the Old English text. Since it is so literal, it is a bit dense, so I wouldn't read it for your first time reading Beowulf, but it is well worth having and consulting if you want to get a better understanding of what the actual text itself says. One other source for primary evidence that I use a lot is the website Electronic Sawyer. Peter Sawyer was an expert on Anglo-Saxon charters, and the website is a searchable database of all recorded charters from the Anglo-Saxon period. 
they are mostly not translated, but you can search pretty much by any category that you could need, possibly need, like date, location, the king who issued them, etc. And it is extremely useful as a historian to have all of these texts digitally collected in one place to consult and to look at as needed. Hello listeners, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I just wanted to let you know that if you enjoy what I'm doing here, then it really helps me when you leave a review or a rating on the podcast provider you're using to listen to this. It also helps when you subscribe to the show's YouTube channel, or when you become a supporter over on Patreon, where you can get access to bonus episodes, ad-free episodes, and transcripts, as well as the opportunity to request specific topics all by pledging to one of the show's Patreon tiers. And speaking of patrons, I want to give a quick shout-out to Ewan. Thank you so much for your support, and I hope you're enjoying the extra material you now have access to. Anyway, back to the show. So now, let's move on to secondary sources. Books on Anglo-Saxon history and society are quite plentiful, although not so much for a general audience, which is unfortunate. So I want to begin with some of the best general histories out there. And I have three recommendations in particular. The first is The Anglo-Saxons, edited by James Campbell, uh, which was for many years the go-to textbook on Anglo-Saxon history. James Campbell's written some of the articles in there, the others were written by other important, valuable historians of their period, like Patrick Wormald, on areas that were their particular areas of focus. So it's a collection of articles written by some of the best scholars of their day. It was first published in 1981, so it isn't the most up-to-date book available, but it is still ideal for a one-volume history by reputable historians, that also features copious illustrations and photos to help visualize what you're reading about. The next book I'd recommend is The Anglo-Saxon World by Nicholas Hyam and Mark Ryan, published in 2013. Like the Campbell book, this is a great one-volume history by good historians. There are two aspects, though, which make it worthwhile. One is obviously that it's a bit more up-to-date than Campbell's book, and as a result, includes some important discoveries made subsequent to 1981, such as the Staffordshire Horde. The other is that between the main chapters, it contains small sub-chapters devoted to a particular source or issue in Anglo-Saxon history, such as the aforementioned Horde, Bede, or the history of the city of York, and this provides a nice bit of source criticism and balance to the larger scale perspective of the main chapters, and it definitely is extremely useful for any aspiring historians. Thirdly is the most recent book, which is Mark Morris's The Anglo-Saxons. This one came out only a few years ago, and of the three books mentioned here, it is the one that's most aimed at a general audience. It's also worth pointing out that Mark Morris's specialisation is in the history of medieval England following the Norman Conquest. So the Anglo-Saxon period is not his particular area of focus. As such, it may be a good place to start learning about Anglo-Saxon history, but it should ideally be bolstered by one or both of the books I mentioned above, which are able to provide quite a bit more detail, and which are written by people who are actually specialists in the topic. Another book I would be remiss not to mention is The Blackwell Encyclopedia of Anglo-Saxon England, this one is another academic text, so expect a hefty price tag, but as a reference book it is extremely useful, with articles on major figures and events, up to things like farming and textile production, all written by experts in the field. For more specific topics, there are obviously a huge number of books available, more than I could possibly go over here. But I will offer just a few of the more easily available ones, or ones that I have the most experience with. For the history of the church in Anglo-Saxon England, John Blair's The Church in Anglo-Saxon Society is a must-read, although Blair is an archaeologist by training, so the book mainly addresses the issue from that perspective. Another good but slightly dated book is 
is Henry Meyer Harting's The Coming of Christianity to Anglo-Saxon England. On Anglo-Saxon paganism, it's necessary to be a bit more cautious, but an excellent book that is available on Kindle is Signals of Belief in Early England, Anglo-Saxon Paganism Revisited, which takes an interdisciplinary approach to the topic of Anglo-Saxon paganism and is rooted in primary evidence and is free from any problematic politics, shall we say. For individual kings, it's difficult to find full book-length studies prior to the reign of Alfred. The Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, which you can find online, has some good articles on a lot of various Anglo-Saxon kings and notable figures. But for book-length studies, beginning with Alfred, I would say Alfred the Great, War, Kingship and Culture in Anglo-Saxon England by Richard Abels is my favourite book on Alfred himself. I also suggest looking at the Alfred the Great book from Penguin Classics, edited by Simon Keynes and Michael Lappage. Sarah Foote's Athelstan, the first king of England, is still to my mind the definitive study of that king and his impact. I can also recommend Levi Roach's Ethelred the Unready and Tom Licence's Edward the Confessor, Last of the Royal Blood. These last three are all part of the English Monarchs series, which is generally a good source for books on various monarchs from throughout British history. I could go on about sources and books and authors and whatnot, and there's a lot more specialised topics that I could cover, but I don't want to bore you. As the podcast goes on, I will work to keep you up to date on relevant books, if that is something that you'd be interested in. I'll also include a list of each of the books mentioned here in the notes to this episode. I hope that you found this enlightening, and I want to wish you happy reading. Thank you for listening. I've been your host, Tom Kearns, and this has been the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. I hope you'll join me again next time.